so thank you everyone for joining. Uh, my name is Nathan Puccini. I am one of the marketing managers here at Data Science Dojo. And today I have Ben Jones with me. He is the co-founder and CEO of Data Literacy, and he also te teaches data visualization at the University of Washington Foster School of Business. Uh, so he's going to be doing a talk on read, write, and think data. So um, Ben, why don't you go ahead and take it away? Or maybe right before that, I can remind myself to tell everyone that for Q&A, we will do all of, uh, answer all of your questions at the end today. Um, if you're in Zoom with us, use that Q&A tab, um, helps us keep everything organized. Um, and then if you're on one of our live streams, feel free to ask your questions. Uh, we will pull them into Zoom for you. So um, ask your questions, uh, you know, talk to us on chat. And Ben, why don't you, now he, Now the floor is yours. <laughs> All right, great. Thanks, Nathan. Yeah, and I can see the chat right here too. So um, feel free to, and so it's nice to see all the greetings from people all around the world, Arizona, right here in Seattle, Toronto, um, yeah, New York City. It's really neat, uh, Southeast Asia. So we have some international representatives. So I just want to say hello to you all and I hope you're doing well wherever you are uh, listening. And also want to say thank you to Nathan, Fatima, as well as Megan Hanno, who's uh, on the call, uh, who works for uh, for uh, my team and just does a fabulous job for us. And I'm happy to uh, just spend a minute with you all uh, today. You know, going over uh, the title of, of the next book that I'm working on is Read, Write, Think Data. And um, this is really a title that came to me because it feels like what's missing, as I'll talk about in this session, isn't a specific tool training offering. I think that there's a lot of that out there, but what is not really uh, as pre as prevalent, you know, uh, is the ability to help someone learn how to think clearly with data, critical thinking skills, understanding how data fits into a broader um, decision making, problem solving, question answering process. So that's what I want to talk about today. And I know that you're on this call or listening or watching the recording. Because you know you're interested, right, in being able to work effectively with data. That's something that you've already noticed is important, and you've probably also noticed that it's important in a variety of contexts, not just not just at work. Um, of course, you know we can realize that some of the issues we face um, in the public sector, in the world in general, even down to our communities, can be. Uh, addressed and hopefully even maybe solved, you know, with some data inputs and even personally, right? What sorts of things are you working on improving about yourself? So there's intuitive emotional components, there's analytical data components. And I think the artful approach to living is to find a way to bring those together, which is very much a theme, you know, in our training. So a bit about me, Nathan already did a great job of introducing, so I won't really go into much more detail only just to say that I really love writing and teaching. I've come to learn a little later in my career that that's really my passion. You know, I spent a lot of time up front coming out of engineering school, going into engineering, as well as then continuous improvements and, um, and even in marketing analytics. The theme, as probably for many of you, was always data, you know, working with data to try to improve the situation, to try to grasp opportunities. And then I made the jump in 2012 to, uh, to Tableau. And that's when I moved uh, from Los Angeles up to the Seattle area where I live now. I'm actually in Bellevue. So, you know, across the lake from uh, the city of Seattle. And, um, you know, while I was at Tableau, I ran the Tableau public platform and loved it. You know, really met a lot of people who are passionate about data, got a chance to travel and teach journalists, students, teachers, uh, at in some of the you know largest universities of the world, how to work effectively with data, and started writing books about what I was learning. So that's really what uh, I'm into. Uh, I also so in, right now I run this business called Data Literacy, and so I left Tableau back in 2018 to help people speak the language of data because I recognized that there was this gap. Like I said, you know, people were trying to learn how to use tool X or tool Y, but they weren't really data literate. And so they were running into problems. They were using these powerful tools to mislead themselves and others, most, mostly just mistakenly. I don't think that people were doing it on purpose, although there is some of that, but mostly they were just realizing at some point, hopefully that, wait a second, I'm trying to make sense of data, but 
I have some important building blocks, some important foundational pieces that are not in place yet. And so it's hard for me to know what to do. And I and, and maybe even, you know, I've been making mistakes all along that I don't know about. And so what we want to do with this business is really help educate people, help build their knowledge and their skills, but also address their attitudes and their behaviors. How do they feel about data? What are the sorts of things they do day in and day out as they contribute, you know, in the workplace, in the communities that they're in and even in their homes. Okay. So that's what data literacy is all about. It's a phrase, you know, what does it even mean? Well, it's widely uh, understood something similar to this, that it's the ability to read, understand, create, and communicate data as information. And so you can see even in those verbs that there's a connection to language. There's a connection to, um, you know, the way we interact with each other and the way we both learn and, and communicate. And so I, I think that that is a helpful um, way to think about learning data. And that's why we build these courses that help people step up and become more and more fluent. So when you're learning a, a foreign language, I grew up in Southern California and I loved Spanish. I took five years of Spanish. I spent time in Central America and just really loved it, you know, and, and did presentations and all that. Um, and at one point was fairly fluent. It's been getting very rusty, but I remember, you know, at, at the beginning, I learned vocabulary words. I learned maybe sentences and sentence structure, how to conjugate verbs, you know, very basic stuff. And that's like our fundamentals course. Just what is this language? What are the elements of it? Help me understand it. And then of course you kind of graduate a bit, you know, in second level, maybe second semester, and you start to read things. You start to read sentences that other people have written, even maybe eventually listening to audio or watching um, Telemundo or something like that, Univision, right? <laughs> the news broadcasts, the telenovelas, trying to figure out what is the meaning behind what these noises are that I'm hearing. And that's really to us, the level one program where you are really kind of coming at it from the point of view of consuming what other people are putting out there and making sense of it. And then eventually you need to kind of step up you know, as you become more and more proficient with data. And that involves rolling up your sleeves and actually working with data, seeing what's there and learning and gathering insights from data. That's our level two program that I'm talking about a bit today. And of course, then level three is where you get into crafting your own messages, becoming not just um, able to communicate, but even perhaps even you know eloquent, right? In the way that you are articulating your thoughts to others and conveying things to them and getting your message across. So we're trying to do all of that with data. And that's why I think that uh, it's a very important thing that, um, that many others in this data literacy movement are also seeking to do. Folks like um, Valerie Logan at the Data Lodge, who really helps companies come up with their game plan. What's, what's your roadmap here for becoming a more data literate organization? And, and many others. And so we really focus on the training piece and also the assessment piece. So that aside, I just wanted to at least kind of help you understand, you know, who I am and why I'm here and why I, I care about the topics I'm going to be talking about. But let's just do a quick exercise. Put in the chat the, uh, the square root of the sum of these five cards. Let's see who I'm looking at the chat. So I'm going to know if you put the answer in. If you're watching the recording, I don't think this part is very useful to you. But OK, so Brian is the winner. Brian and also Betsy. Jose and Mike, they're right up there on their on the on the money. This is clearly, you know, not rocket science. This is five. We can add up three, four, five, six, and seven, and we get 25. We take the square root of that and we get five. So nice job. It's good to see everyone's awake and they've got uh, you know, their um, their wits about them <laughs> and they have the ability to use the chat. So that's great. Uh, so let's speaking of observing, right? That's really what you were doing. You're looking at these numbers, you're doing some mental math, you're doing a little bit of an equation in your head. Well, here's another question I have for you. You're looking right now at six world maps. Let's just see for fun if someone could guess, what do they have in common? They all have one thing in common. I'll give you a clue to help maybe narrow it down. But at the beginning, I just want to say, I just want to know if anybody can come up with a wild guess of what these six world maps all have in common, okay? So take a look, you know, use your powers of observation to check it out and see what it might be now. Oh, okay. So you got to be kidding me. Seth completely nailed it right out of the gate. They're all missing New Zealand. How did you, I did not, I don't, Seth and I have never met. I did not communicate with him ahead of time. 
He's absolutely right. These are all missing New Zealand. It happens to be a thing. You know, there's even a subreddit maps without New Zealand on them. There used to be a Tumblr, but I don't think that's a thing anymore. I don't know. Anyway, uh, you know, it so happens to be the case that uh, people, when they put world maps out there, often drop New Zealand entirely from the view. Now, why? Well, of course, the common, let's say, I guess, supposedly Western way of centering a projection of a globe would include New Zealand being in the bottom right corner and just getting cropped out, of course, right? Uh, and it's no, it is certainly not far from Australia. Uh, Mary, it certainly is close enough, I would say they would argue to be included on the map. Um, but when we talk about New Zealand in honor of New Zealand and to make up for all of those errors that uh, probably I've made too at times, let's think about the map of New Zealand. Well, there it is right there. There's, there's New Zealand. Okay, well, the Maori people lived there for centuries before anyone from Europe ever knew that there was um, anything there. And so it so happens that the first European to sail upon New Zealand was a Dutch explorer by the name of Abel Tasman after whom Tasmania is named, you guessed it. Now, um, so he cruised along there and he, uh, in his Zihane, the name of his ship was Zihane. He and his crew decided to name this area in the middle of New Zealand. They called it Zihane's Bight. Zihane after his ship, bite after, uh, not a bite out of a sandwich, although there is a connection there. There's certainly a resemblance. Uh, a bite with B-I-G-H-T happens to be a crescent shaped recession in a coastline. This is actually uh, where I, I didn't I didn't know that until I was researching this topic, but I happen to have lived right by one here in Southern California for much of my life. So Zihane's bite. Okay, we're going to come back to to uh, New Zealand and Zihane and uh, what it is that uh, that we see there. But uh, for now, um, again, just all I'm really trying to do is make up to New Zealanders, <laughs> and so we'll focus on their map. But, you know, we talk about explorers, we talk about sailing on something that you are seeing for the very first time. And I can really relate to that experience because, you know, when I moved from Los Angeles up to, to Seattle, like I mentioned, um, I uh, wanted to learn how to hike. I don't know why. I just had this, like, urge to get out there on the trails and experience nature. I was never that kind of kid growing up in Los Angeles. I was too busy riding my skateboard or playing soccer or Nintendo, you know, going on a nature walk would have been the most boring thing ever. I would have tuned you right out. But then for some reason, I turned 30, 35 and got into my 40s. And I just really wanted to be on the trails. And so, you know, I, I decided I was going to do that. Now, when I came here, I didn't know the first thing about it. I mean, I didn't I, I was I didn't know where to go. I was new to the area. I didn't have any um, like equipment or any even good shoes to take on the trails with me. But I was determined, you know, so what did I do? Well, I started researching it. I started talking to other dads at the soccer practice and asking them where I should be going. They mentioned a few trails I would never go on today because they're completely overrun. <laughs> Don't go to Rattlesnake Ledge if you ever come to Seattle. But uh, those were places that seemed so exotic to me. Like, wow, there's this trail out there called Rattlesnake Ledge. Oh, my gosh, I got to get out there and try it. And then I get out there with my kids and I'd be like, well, am I going to get lost or eaten by a bear. I mean, I was so nervous, right? And so I had these devices and gears trying to track my GPS. And it seemed for sure like I was lost many, many times. And so I was just stepping out, you know, into this activity that it wanted to get good at. And it was pretty intimidating. And I had so much to learn, but I did it. And I uh, got to the place where, you know, we, we love uh, this activity. We backpack for multiple nights at a time and, um, you know, still haven't been eaten by a bear, still haven't seen a bear, but I'm at the knock on wood because that is almost inviting the issue, I think. <laughs> but here we are. Uh, this is me and my family and uh, our little dog, Winston, who magically is off a leash and still there. Uh, so <laughs> that's like the one time it's happened. And he even stayed long enough for the counter on the timer on the tripod to go 10 seconds and take the photo. This is a place called Spectacle Lake, but you have to promise me to keep that a secret. It's not a great secret. It's actually on the, the um, PCT, the Pacific Crest Trail, or very close to it. And so some people know about it, but it's a beautiful place. But my point is, this is a, the process of adopting something new, the process of exploring. These are really things we can all relate to. You know, there was times where you try to pick up something and you started to, to do that. Well, this is what we all need to do with data today. And people are petrified of it. And so they feel left out. 
of this data revolution that's just been um, going by them over their heads and they're trying to play catch up, maybe even afraid to say that they're not uh, really that uh, comfortable with the topic at all. And so, you know, we're trying to help them do that. When you're on the trails, one thing you notice pretty quickly is signs, signs everywhere, you know, signs, including those that are warning you <laughs> not to do. This one is actually on a Cold Creek Trail here in Bellevue, maybe about a mile and a half from where I'm sitting right now. And so uh, it says, warning, keep out. And it's interesting, on the other side of the sign is this huge bowl in the ground. And evidently, if you step in it, you're going to fall right to the bottom of the center of the earth, I think. It's some kind of a, what do they call this? Like, um, yeah, it's, remember when we were kids, quicksand was the thing we were always afraid of. But evidently, this is some kind of a, an area in the hillside that is susceptible to completely falling away. Thank you, Mike. Yes, a sinkhole. <laughs> Why did the word just completely escape me? I think it's because, as I said, I'm in my 40s. But my point is, there are these signs. Okay, I will never forget the one that I was on called the Timberline Trail. We go around Mount Hood down in Oregon. And there's this pencil scratch sign nailed to a tree. It just says, don't do it. That's it. <laughs> So I look on the other side of this sign and there's this rope, you know, and we had these big heavy packs on. And so needless to say, we didn't do it, but the alternative wasn't great either. <laughs> we had to hike for miles up and over this ridge line and through this scree field. And it was, it was bad. It ended up being that we didn't get off the trail until 1130, but the point at night, but the point is, you know, there are these signs that t tell you what to do, what not to do. And so my, my, uh, observation is that when it comes to working with data, we don't have those signs right now. You know, people are stumbling forward, working with data, doing their best with great intentions, using very powerful tools, and yet completely making mistakes left and right. And so we need some signs. We need some roadmaps and, you know, some maps of the terrain. We need to understand the sorts of things to look out for and, and, um, and avoid, just like someone who's, uh, you know, uh, really experienced with hiking would would uh, be able to tell you all about if they were to take you around and and point out some of the things. And they probably learned that the hard way. You know, that's how a lot of us have been learning by making some of those mistakes because we have been adopting technologies. This is not really new to us. This is our entire era, our generation. If we've done nothing else, it's adopt new technologies one after another after another. Uh, in the 80s, we had to learn, you know, this was the PC revolution. We had to learn word processing. I remember some of my first reports that I was turning in by computer. We used to have those little perforated little, uh, what was it called again? Someone helped me, a dot matrix printer. And you had to rip off the edges and staple it and turn it into your fifth grade teacher, a report on the ocelot. I don't know, right? <laughs> Before, we would just do it by hand. I mean, I'm old enough to remember that switchover in the 80s to when all these reports had to be done by hand. Yeah, and you can see here how you can learn, you can learn how to use WordStar in just four or five hours. CompuLit, my kids used to like that, and now they just cringe. You know, it's, it's not cool anymore to make a joke about something being lit. So I just leave that alone, even though I just didn't do that. But my point is that this is something we had to adopt, and actually we did. It really wasn't that hard. We got good at it. What is left justifying, right justifying? How do I make it? italics, all that, right? We did it. And then in the 90s, along comes the internet. We have to learn how to email. We have to learn how to use the internet and browse. We start putting things like Netscape Navigator on our resumes. This was back in the day. I went to UCLA in the 90s. In 1996, when I started my freshman year of UCLA, I had to register for my classes with a phone and a big thick booklet of all, book, not a booklet, a book. You could like use it as a probably a doorstop. I don't know. And we have to dial up and put our numbers in of the classes we wanted to register. By the time I graduated in 2000, it was all online. Everything you just do online, your courses online, your assignments online, everything. And I, I would have loved, though, if I could get a hold of this video professor's learn to use the internet, it would probably be a classic. They probably wear really bad sweaters and have funny wavy hair. I don't know. You know, you got to love the 80s and the 90s, right? It was a great time to be alive, to be growing up. Uh, but we had to learn how to use the internet and adopt that. Oh, my gosh. Did we do it? Yeah. I'm not so sure we're that good at it, but that's another story. We certainly know how to use the browser and click our way around. And nobody says they know how to use Chrome on their resume anymore. I certainly doubt it. Uh, but that is, again, something we had to adopt. Now, 2000s come along. We all of a sudden have the internet in our pockets. And we see the rise of these social media networks. 
the Facebook right there. Welcome to the Facebook. So we had to learn how to, what, what do I use Facebook for that I don't use Twitter for? And what about LinkedIn? What am I using that for now? We've all kind of figured it out, I think. You know, we kind of know what this platform does and what why I would be here versus there. And so these are technologies we've all gone about adopting. Now, when it comes to working with data, uh, this digital revolution, this third and now even fourth parallel industrial revolutions have totally changed the way we work with data. We've been working with data as a species for thousands of years. I mean, that's not new. You can find newspaper um, articles from the 16th, 1700s dealing with mortality figures. You can even find tablets etched with sheep sales from one you know, town leader to another. So we've been working with data. This is not new. But in 1979, VisiCalc comes out on the Apple II. This turned a hobbyist toy, the PC, into a legitimate business tool. And that really, in some people's minds, completely fueled the PC revolution that just took off. Now, uh, here's an ad from the 1980s, how to turn a sea of data into data you can see. And you got a big stack of paper there with tables and now all of a sudden it's being replaced with these fancy colorful charts and graphs, right? And so um, we work with data all the time now and it's just continued to accelerate. You take a early screenshot of Tableau, my former employer there on the left, 2003. And now you can see what sorts of things are possible in uh, the current version of that tool that has evolved so amazingly in the past few decades. And that's not the only one. There are so many of these tools, you know all about them. It's interesting, some of the most commonly used tools have been around for a long time. SQL was invented in the early 1970s, you know, by Chamberlain, uh, Donald Chamberlain and, and, um, and Boyce. The two of them came up with SQL, it's still one of the most common tools, but we've had on top of that, just this massive evolution of tools. But with new tools, still no New Zealand. Did I, did I miss New Zealand? Was there a world map? Oh, it's got to be in there. It's got to, no, you got to tell me it's in there, right? It's there, but it's being covered by the legend. Oh my gosh, Mike, you're right. I got to fix that. New Zealand, it's there, but it is being just rudely covered by a legend. Even worse, maybe, even worse. Just slapped right on top of them as if they're not even there. So, <laughs> thank you. Nice catch. So, when we talk about technologies, clearly, as I've just shown, well, here's what happens. You take, a, take the automobile. 1920, it starts to be introduced on streets all around the world, city streets. And the number of miles of, um, you know, uh, traveled just climbs, doesn't it? You know, exponentially, really, um, to, to the present day. And so, along with the adoption of that technology, the automobile, we see this corresponding plummet in fatality rates per mile, per 100, per 100 million miles. Um, so, you know, there is this simultaneous adoption. As the adoption accelerates, we start to see some of the problems with that technology being addressed, okay? It is not hard to imagine why it was so dangerous back then to have a car around. You know, the whole city was not structured to have automobiles, people were being hit left and right, you know, sadly, right? But then you get seat belts, then you get lanes, then you get, you know, all the uh, safety requirements and regulations that go along. You get so many different um, uh, safety um, sort of aspects kind of put in place. And then you see the fatality rate plummet. Uh, and so, you know, this is what we need to do with data. I think we're in the early, let me go back. We're in the early stages, I think here. Uh, as a species, certainly, we've been around uh, for a few hundred thousand years, the Homo sapiens. Those are some when the earliest were discovered. And so uh, when you think about that and, and the percentage of the history of our species that has been working with data in digital form at the level we have, we are just at the very, the very beginning stages of it. And so we have a long way to go. And so we need time to get it right. We need time to address some of the problems, right? And this is where data literacy comes in. Um, so there's a book we wrote called The 17 Key Traits of Data Literacy. I'm a real big fan of Alberto Cairo. He's on our board. He's written a number of great books. I'm sure you already know about them, How Charts Lie, The Truthful Art, The Functional Art. And he, he talks about working with data involving numerical and graphical literacy called numeracy and graphicacy. 
And this is also, you know, uh, ability to work with numbers, but he talks about even there being a sixth sense that's involved there. We'll get more, we'll get back to that. He also mentions graphicacy, this ability to understand uh, the visual language of data, charts and graphs, hence the word graphicacy. And so we can say that, you know, being data literate involves, you know, each of these involves being uh, both numerate and having um, acquired a certain level of graphicacy. And so I think there are other things as well, technical skills, communication skills, also being able to apply that to your domain, wherever that may be. If we think about numeracy, and if you don't believe me yet that we're in the early stages with the automobile uh, bumping into people all over every city street and every corner, then let's talk about it a bit. You know, we've certainly here in the United States, we've seen studies that show that uh, the U.S. Uh, adult uh, lags in numeracy. This is a study that was done a little while ago, um, about eight years ago now, I suppose. And so you can see that the United States ranks, you know, fairly low in numeracy. Uh, so, um, you know, let's try a little quiz. Okay, so here you go. Let's use the chat. Together, a bat and a ball costs a dollar ten. The bat costs a dollar more than the ball. What's your first gut reaction for how much the ball costs? Put it in the chat. Your very first gut reaction to the question, how much does the ball cost if the, the bat costs a dollar more? So I see some answers coming in here. Yeah, right, I'm with you all, right? The, the, uh, the 10 cent, you think it's 10 cents, right? You think it's 10 cents. Well, if the bat costs a dollar more than the ball and together they cost a dollar 10, that means, well, it's clearly the ball costs 10 cents, but no, that's wrong. I mean, we're seeing the right answer coming in now. Megan, David, uh, getting it right. It's five cents, it's five cents because if the bat costs a dollar more than the ball and together they add up to 110, think about it again. You know, it's it's gotta be five cents. And then the bat's a dollar five. And then together those add up to a dollar ten. But if the ball costs 10 cents and then the bat costs a dollar more, then it costs a dollar ten. And if you add those together, you get a dollar twenty. So the point is, and this is really just a little trick question. They did this exact quiz to. Ivy leaguers and you know a high percentage of them got it wrong, like more almost half, I believe, if I'm not mistaken. So we have these glitches, you know, as humans, we get kind of like you know get the numbers wrong. We're not always we're not always really kind of having the 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 right intuition about numbers and how they work. They get us into trouble a lot, you know, percentages, rates. These things make it even more complex. So we we need to really build our immune system, let's say, to these sorts of hiccups. Uh, and, uh, and I don't think you have an immune, I don't think your immune system helps with hiccups. So that's a terrible analogy. I don't really want to make the other analogy about the immune system because we're tired of hearing about it. <laughs> but we do as a species need to get good at knowing these little glitches and when they pop up. And so that's something that, uh, that I think that uh, we can, we can all help with. I mean, we all need to work on that together. When it comes to graphicacy, reading charts and graphs, most people, if you think, hey, can you read a chart? I'll say, well, yeah, of course I can read a chart. I mean, you know, they're basic, right? Just show me the chart. I get it. I can tell you what it means. Well, the fact of the matter is, you know, people struggle to read and interpret charts. Here's a, a study from Pew Research uh, where 63% of American adults were able to get a uh, correct answer. Okay. So you tell me what you think it is. There's a scatter plot here. Average sugar consumption on the x-axis, average number of teeth decayed per person and every dot is a country. Okay, so what is the correct statement? that The statement that the graph most, uh, let's say, uh, describes. And, and so A, in recent years, the rate of cavities has increased in many countries. B, in some countries, people brush their teeth more frequently than in other countries. C, the more sugar people eat, the more likely they are to get cavities. Or D, in recent years, the consumption of sugar has increased in many countries. Which do you think it would be? Yeah, everyone's nailing this one, C. Yeah, C is the right answer, but, and this is a data savvy group because it's a fact that 37% of the folks polled by Pew Research got that wrong. And I would say, you know, that's a fairly basic chart, right? And so uh, this, is, this is true in general that we struggle to read and interpret charts. We're not there yet. We get it wrong a lot. I do too. Now you talk about, I, I said I wasn't going to mention it, but here it is, right? We talk about COVID. Well, there's a disease that spreads. Okay, well, unfortunately, as we learned, that can spread at an exponential rate or uh, according to maybe even a power law, let's say. And so that's an appropriate way to, at least in terms of engineering, uh, relate to that data in a log chart, like the one on the right over here, where we see uh, the logarithmic scale uh, vertically. 
And we see also then, you know, another version of the same data on the left, which is a linear scale where the uh, grid lines are 10,000 each over on the right. It's the grid lines are a factor of 10 each. And so when they showed these charts to people and asked them to some basic questions of interpretation, 84% were able to answer correctly using the linear chart whereas only 40% were able to answer using the log version of the line chart. And so, you know, you could say, well, then don't use a log version of the line chart, uh, but there might be instances where the growth rate is so high that you're not able to see anything. Everything collapses immediately to the x-axis. Those of you who have toyed with or played with switching between those axes, you know what I mean. Uh, so, you know, these are more challenging situations. It's not a basic scatter plot. It's a line chart that has a log scale to it. And now we're losing even more people. But, you know, this is an important topic. We all needed to understand what uh, we needed to do to keep ourselves and our families safe. And so, you know, there are potentially, um, you know, great benefits to being able to read a log chart uh, well. And so, you know, again, not everyone has that skill yet. And so this is something we need to learn. I love this quote. For, this is the, she is my muse for my level one course, Mary Eleanor Spear. She worked for a lot of different US federal agencies, the IRS, Bureau of Labor and Statistics for decades from 1920 to like the late sixties. And her name is Mary Eleanor Spear. She wrote a book called Practical Charting Techniques. And this is the quote that I put in front of me every day when I was trying to create my level one course, learning to see data because she says that we need to learn to see details. There's quite a difference between simply looking at a chart and seeing it. Looking is your first visual impression while seeing involves the studying of distinct parts of the visual. Just a key skill, we all need to have that, right? Now, Alberto talks about, I mentioned a sixth sense, that it isn't a science here, we can't get it perfect. He talks about needing to have an intuition and even tentative grasps of these concepts of what to do, of what works well in certain situations. This is not exactly a perfect process. We can just nail it down and get it all right. And I agree with him on that. I think we have to become more experienced. We have to have more of a spidey sense about the kinds of pitfalls we've been talking about, the kinds of problems that you encounter on the trail of data working as you go through the mountains and valleys and try to find your way to a higher place. So this is a question that I think we need to address as a species at this point in our species' history. How do we steer clear of common pitfalls now that the tools and technologies have evolved to be so powerful? What's missing is our own skill. And that's where I hope our courses can come in. What's also missing is a good process. And that is missing. Um, this is a screenshot you're looking at here from our, uh, our data literacy score, team-based assessment. We send out surveys, we're doing one right now, where we pull and survey or, uh, team members within an organization, a number of questions in each of these categories. You know, What are the sorts of things that you're struggling with? How well do some of these areas apply to your team? And so it's very subjective. You know, It's their opinion, their point of view, but it's a very useful lens. What we see at the bottom every time is the process category. Um, and so we think about other domains, other disciplines, science, they have their scientific method. This is nothing new. We all learned this in grade school. Now, a practicing scientist would tell you it isn't very clean. I mean, you know, it's a lot messier than it looks here on this fancy flow chart. But there is a method that they have as their kind of overarching, um, you know, Bible, for lack of a better word. Uh, if you're in quality control, you've learned the PDCA a process, plan, do, check, act, developed by quality guru W. Edwards Deming. Uh, actually, even earlier than him, I think he popularized it. But this is a process to try to improve and reduce defects and flaws in manufacturing and such. So they've been doing that. I spent a lot of my time uh, in Lean Sigma movement uh, with, a, with a black belt. My dad was like, I thought I put you through engineering school. <laughs> what do you mean you're a black belt? But uh, nonetheless, I did learn how to improve processes using a methodology. You know, it was pretty kind of got a little bit old after a while, but I mean, it worked. We, we saved the companies a lot of money uh, going through this process of identifying and, and improving and tracking and sustaining the gains, hopefully. So there's a process for that. So this is what I have tried to do. I've tried to build a process for analyzing data, for working effectively with data. 
for thinking critically about data. And that's what we're teaching in our level two course. I thought about a lot of things. Should it be a loop? Should it be a circle? Should it be, you know, what, what is the structure of it? And ultimately I want it to be a stairway type of a, of a process. And then this could be then something we continue carrying on, right? So we just continually step up using data to become, um, you know, wiser, more mature, improving things. And that is, I guess, the, the, uh, the overall kind of the high level, you know, at least the, the ideology that I'm trying to put in place and implement. And here it is in all its glory. Now, you know, I was always told never show this all at once at a free because it's too way overwhelming, but we try to organize it, you know, to make it feel like it's less intimidating. It's a flow chart, you know, and, and it, it, just like the scientific method, it is not something you step through perfectly linearly. No, it's messy. You loop back. You're not really sure where you are maybe sometimes, but this is this idea that we can teach people when they're first starting to work with raw data, you know, jumping over that gulf from the world of a chart reader to the world of a chart maker. We need to get more people over that gulf. When you land on the other side of the gulf, after some big, huge leap, you find that the ground is very muddy and messy. So we'll get to that in a minute. But the idea is, how do you now make your way through this terrain you've landed within, where you are now actively exploring data, taking a look at it, seeing what's there. And as you can see, the process starts with an observation. The best skill that you can learn as a data analyst is to be highly observant, to have very keen skills of observation. That's more important than learning how to use tool X or tool Y or any of it, for sure. You know, being able to observe um, Marcus Aurelius, Roman emperor, Stoic philosopher. He says, nothing has such power to broaden the mind as the ability to investigate systematically and truly all that comes under the observation in life. Speaking of observations, did you notice anything strange about those cards? Now that I ask it that way, do you see something that that presents itself to you as being odd or strange as I'm looking here at the chat. You just looked at these exact same cards. I promise it's the same, it's the same one. Is it a nice poker hand? It is a nice poker hand. This would be, of course, a straight. I would love that. And so, yeah, um, Tamara or Tamara and uh, David and uh, Marcy got it right. So maybe you noticed it. Look, I promise everybody's like, yeah, yeah, right. You, you, you changed this live. No, and I didn't, there's no way I could have changed it. You see, here it is, same one. Okay, now I proved it to you. And so what's crazy about the human experience is we think we see things, you know, but we miss things. We miss things that are right in front of our nose. Uh, that should be, of course, in a standard 52 card deck, a red heart, of course, no, no doubt. And so uh, some early research about into something called inattentional blindness in the, 40, uh, in the 40s was conducted in Harvard, Bruner and Postman. They coined something called the incongruity, the thing that's right in front of you that is out of place, but, but you don't see it yet. Uh, because if you still don't believe me that it was not just the five of hearts that was out of place, maybe if you were really savvy, you noticed that the original version actually had, let me go back to it to prove it to you, uh, actually had eight clubs on the seven here, right? So that is actually uh, an eight of clubs, maybe a little more tricky to notice that one. But the point is, again, we, there are things right in front of our, our noses and we miss them all the time. So being keen observing observer. I love this quote. This is my favorite quote on the topic. Daido Moriyama, Japanese street photographer. You're not going to develop a discerning eye unless you hone your ability to give something your full and undivided attention. Of course, we need to learn how to ask good questions of data. Voltaire said to judge a man by his questions rather than his answers. Nancy Willard, American writer, says sometimes questions are more important than answers. We can all know the journalism school five W's and one H. Who, what, when, where, why, and how. In our courses, we teach people to go beyond that. We talk about a dozen hows to ask your data. These are specific questions that are tailored you know, to data. Yes, the five Ws and one H, sure, we can use that to act as a guide as we start to ask questions about a data set. But sometimes we need something a little more detailed than that, a little more nuanced that really gets to the sorts of questions that data is really good at answering, okay? But there's always this critical skill piece. Sometimes the most important question isn't about the data, it's about what's not there. Uh, in the adventure of Silver Blaze, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, this is Sherlock Holmes story. Holmes is having a conversation with Gregory, Scotland Yard inspector, when the, um, a, uh, a horse's trainer was killed. And Gregory says, is there any point to which you would wish to draw my attention? Holmes says, to the curious incident of the dog in the nighttime. Gregory said, the dog did nothing in the nighttime. 
Holmes, that was a curious incident. The point is he was keen enough to recognize that he needed to think about the thing that wasn't there. The dog made no noise. How is that possible that there was a trainer dead in the horse stable when there was a dog there too and the dog didn't make any noise? You get it. The point is this is not about Tableau or R or Python. This is about you thinking. This is about you thinking and having your brain engaged. We're big believers you need to explore the contours of your data before you dive in and use it to answer anything. You just have to profile it. You have to see what's there. Walk around it, size it up, see what's there. So Tasman, you know, you go to this area right now. This is not called Z. Haynes Bite. It's called Cook Strait because James Cook, 100 years later, British explorer, he and his crew circumnavigated New Zealand, not the island of New Zealand, the plural islands of New Zealand too, north and south, separated by a navigable waterway, 22 kilometers in its narrowest point, notoriously boisterous, by the way, and he sailed right through it. Tasman didn't even notice that there was a null there, to use data terminology, a blank, a missing piece of land. And so Tasman sailed away with a complete wrong idea about New Zealand, not just a detail about New Zealand, by the way, the single most important geographic fact about New Zealand is it has two major islands, and he totally missed it. And James Cook didn't. And that's why it's called Cook Strait. And that's why when we take a look at data before we use it, we have to look closely at it, see what's there. Luckily, tools now make it so easy. You know, in the left Tableau prep, this is a tool with a profile pane. You get a bird's eye view of your data. Same thing in Power Query Editor. If you know enough to go in and turn on the data preview options in the view tab of Power Query Editor, you can see the bird's eye view of all of your variables, their shapes, their mins, their maxes, their averages. You can just, in two minutes or less, get a very thorough uh, profile of your data set. You got to do that. Uh, cleaning and structuring it. Absolutely need to do that too. We're going to get to Q&A here in a minute, but talking about cleaning data, well, it's always dirty, isn't it? It's very rare that data is super clean and pristine. Very rare. I come across data all the time and it's in terrible shape. A notoriously dirty data set that I encountered was Baltimore City towing records. You can see the URL here. There was uh, over 61,000 vehicles or tows between uh, in about a half a, decade, a half a decade period there. And you can see the spreadsheet here on a screenshot of it. And it tells you when the tow happened, the vehicle make and model and uh, how much was charged and, and all the rest, right? So let's take a look at this data. What if we have a basic question like, well, what's the most common makes that get towed? Honda, Ford, Chevy, Toyota, Dodge, Nissan, Toyota, Honda, Acura, Ford. Wait a minute. We're starting to see some repeats here, aren't we? What's going on there? Well, you can see Ford in the 61,000 rows. You also, though, if you look carefully, find Ford in all caps. You find Forf, and you find Ford with three R's. Um, there's Peter Bilt. There's also Peter Belt. There's even Peter Butt. And there's just Pete. And I don't think he would really like being towed if it's just Pete. But those are all, I think, referring to a large semi-truck. I wouldn't recommend Mitsubishi use one of the misspellings of their car for a marketing campaign. But there you have it. I won't say it, but <laughs> Mitsubishi, shit. there I said it. Uh, there's also burnt car. Who knows what that is? I don't know, burnt car. Do you know Volkswagen is spelled 36 different ways in that data set? And you here you are and you can see them all. And I, th and I laughed at that until I realized, wait a minute, I think I would have probably spelled it wrong <laughs> myself. Uh, so it's dirty data, right? So we need to clean it up. Okay, so we do that. We clean it up. We use some fancy tools to go in and change values and switch it around. So what? What happens? Well, what's the effect of all of that cleanup? Now we get to analyze the data. What is it telling us? Well, what it's telling us is that the top three aren't even in the right order. Before, on the left, the cleanup, it was Honda, Ford, Chevy. After the cleanup, it's Honda, Ford, Toyota, right? So they're in a different, not only are they in a different order, you can see the number of Hondas towed 5,200 jumps to 7,700. That's 50% more tows. We were off by quite a bit. It's not like a little bit, half a percent or a percent or even 10%. It's off by 50% in terms of the number of tows that were occurring. Remember our friend Volkswagen? It goes from the 26th ranked tow up to the 11th because there are so many ways it gets misspelled. It, it leapfrogs almost into the top 10. And so, you know, again, you know, we can see that our analysis completely changed because we spent some time cleaning the data. And so I'll stop there, but I, and I want to kind of get to some questions, but uh, actually it looks like there's one in here already. I'll get to, 
The point I want to make, though, is that you know what we need now is a way to, to step through this process. Now, I do not think that uh, it is in the, the best way to use this. Pro I do not think the best way to use this process is to follow it step by step. No, it's like if you learn how to ski you know, or snowboard or something. At first, yes, you need to pay attention to every little move and your balance and the edges of the, the ski or the snowboard and, you know, and all the rest, if you've, you've ever gone through, or like I was saying, hiking, I did need to pay very close attention to many details that now, that now I don't, the gear is second nature. I just, just do it. And, you know, and it's, it's just very much natural. And so working with data is like that too. First, you learn this process very carefully, step-by-step, step. eventually, the process sort of just becomes the way you do things in my experience. And that's where we're trying to get to where these things are kind of, again, you know, second nature to us as a species. Um, and, and so that's my hope, you know, is that we can find a way just like my two boys here uh, climbing this nice little trail carved out of this gnarly looking hillside. This is a twin falls hike just outside of Seattle here. And it's a journey to a higher place, right? There they are stepping it up. Thankfully the forestry crew have made a nice trail there for us. That's like all the tools. We had a nice trail map. That's like our process, you know? And so these um, sorts of components, I think, help us to get places and have experiences and learn and grow. And that's what it's all about. Okay, so I'll stop there. I want to get some questions going here. Uh, but by the way, I do want to let you know, though, uh, while you all just submit your questions, that uh, if there are any, that you can't, we're about to launch this as an on-demand course. And we teach this for corporate groups all the time. And so if you go to this link right here on our website, which is dataliteracy.com, there's a wait list here. And it's going to be just a matter of a week or less, hopefully. I'm in the final stages of putting together and the finishing touches on the on-demand course. It'll look something, well, here, this is a, this is a view at it of it live right now. And so you're going to be able to kind of, you know, get into a few different um, of these different modules and lessons. This is going to be something that helps you hopefully, um, you know, kind of go through some tutorials as well, ways to learn how to not just talk about it and think about it, but how to actually roll up your sleeves and do it. SQL, Excel, we're, we're making it tool agnostic. We're trying to teach the process, which means we have to layer in uh, tutorials for many different tools you know, along the way. Okay, so that's our goal. And uh, we've been working hard on it. I think it's um, something that's hopefully going to help a lot of people. I know I would say it's, I feel like it's my life's work up until this point. Where I go from here, I don't know. But I do know that this is something I really wanted to get out there when I was at Tableau. I saw many people making mistakes. I noticed I was doing that myself too. I wanted to create a map that we can maybe try to follow and learn. And that's been my goal. Okay, so with that, let's see what questions we have here. Yeah, thanks a lot, Kevin. I appreciate it. Jose, but wouldn't your experience as a whole uh, entirely affect how you analyze? 100%. Yes, your experience has a huge impact on how you analyze. How you go, and I love that about it, how you go through this process, Jose, very different than how I would go through this process using the exact same data set. So what this, and I'm glad you mentioned that because this does not guarantee that you and someone else arrives at the same location using the same data and even the same tools, even sitting in the same room. No, because your brain is going to be uh, going through the motions slightly differently sometimes, sometimes dramatically differently. The intuitive spark that you have, my favorite branch of the process is this one at the top, find another question. Oftentimes you're working with data, all of a sudden you realize, wait a minute, if that's the case, then I have another question. Now that's not gonna happen to everybody the same way. There's no way. And this is why it is good to be working with data as a team member on teams of other people who are highly data literate, because you're going to get to different places. It isn't like the trail map where you hope to get to the waterfall like everybody else, you know? If you end up somewhere else, you're probably in trouble. Not that at all here. You're gonna end up in somewhere very different from me and from everyone. Um, so yeah, thank you for, for mentioning that because I think it's a really important point to make. And I've never thought to make that point. That never occurred to me that it was something worth stressing. Um, I'm looking at some more comments coming through here. Uh, Kamal, do I need a college degree to break into the data analytics career? Great question, Kamal. I have uh, three boys right now. They're in college, you know, um, and so my my thought is that it doesn't hurt, but I also think there are so many great uh, resources out there now, you know, that if you have spent the time learning it, whether it's at a university or in boot camps, uh, or if you like to read books, you know, there's lots of great books out there. The bottom line is if you learn it, 
And then you have a good portfolio of uh, work that you have done. And this is where it can be helpful to do different kinds of work that you can put in the public domain, your own passion projects. You, as you learn things, try them out on data that's out there. And um, that's a way to build your portfolio. I think it's possible to have a really great career with no degree uh, in the data world, in data science and all that. Um, but that's my guess. You know, I'm not in that world right now of trying to break in. I see my boys doing it and uh, those questions are on my mind as well. But yes, I think it's possible. Of course, having a degree does not hurt. At the end of the day, though, it comes down to how good are you and, you know, can you be personable? Can you meet and connect and make human connections and then find ways to collaborate? Those to me are the key skills. And I hope we're moving away from a world where a specific checkbox, like a degree of a certain kind or what have you, is less important. Because then that's all everybody does. They just check the box, but they may not really have learned, you know. But anyway, we could talk more about that and just the education system in general. But there are some great schools out there now. When I was at Tableau, I ran the academics program and I worked with people that were thinking day and night about how to make their college, their university data programs better and better and better. You know, and so it is a, a good place to learn these skills. It's tricky though, right? Because the, the skills are changing very quickly. And so that is not always academia's virtue that it pivots and adjusts quickly. Um, and so even if you get a degree, you probably need to bolster it. You augment it or enhance it with some of these other more nimble approaches that are out there, you know. Yeah. 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 Practice, practice, practice. That's what, yeah, that's right. what it comes down to. Yeah. No <laughs> doubt. Right. Yeah. Uh, Nathan, where should we go? I know we only got a couple minutes left. So what's um, the way to wrap it up? We have, let's answer two more questions. Okay, um, cool. The first one, and I, I know you, I think you've just been going through the chat. Let's yeah. answer Jose's question in the chat about analysis and writing. And then we have one question in the Q and a that's been in there for Oh, cool. um, for a little bit. So I want to make sure we get to answer that. One. Yeah. Someone actually followed the instructions, Nathan. And so yeah. <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> no, but, actually, but I can give the different instructions. So everybody's like, wait a minute. Yeah. Okay. So Jose says, so is doing analysis kind of like writing to be a good writer. You need to read a lot of books to see different techniques and ideas to be a great analyst. Do we need to see and understand different analytical projects trying to figure out how to get beyond the crowd? You know, it isn't really about, um, seeing other people's analysis, it's more about eventually doing it, you know, um, but in that sense, okay, so to be a great, <laughs> I'll never forget my first book, Communicating Data with Tableau. I was really lucky to have a great editor. Uh, her name is Julie Steele. She worked at O'Reilly Media at the time. She announced that she was leaving the day the book published, but I was really lucky to get her, um, uh, her input as my, as my, uh, my editor. Because, wow, did she um, completely tear me up at the beginning. I mean, my writing was terrible at the beginning. And she helped me understand that. And I had read a lot up until that point. You know, I had read books and books and books. I love reading. Uh, but when it came to writing down my own thoughts, thoughts and articulating them, my thoughts were all over the place. And the writing was run on sentences like you wouldn't believe. And she almost like made fun of me. You know, I kind of probably needed it. So Julie, if you're out there, you know, thank you. Um, but I had to write to get better at writing. I couldn't read more books to get better at writing. I think it's like that with data. You know, we can see other people's analysis, but it would be kind of like watching a movie of someone going on a hike. You still don't really know. So ultimately I have to put my boots on the trail. And I think it's like that with data. You have to crack open the, <laughs> the database or the CSV or whatever, whatever it is, and you have to step into it. So that's, I think, really the key. You know, it's a participative kind of a thing. So I'll stop there. Hopefully that answers your question. It can't hurt to see what other people do and see the way they analyze data. You can certainly learn a lot that way, but really to get good at it, you've got to do it. Um, okay, so uh, Nathan, you mentioned there was a question, right, uh, in the, in the Q&A box. So did you want to, I don't think I can see that. Oh, there it is. I can see it. Yep, now it is. I do see it. This is from Drew. Do you feel there is a difference between data literacy and what might be called scientific experimental literacy? As a species, we have a much longer history in the latter, still a long ways to go for both. Yeah, you know, scientific literacy to me, the scientific method. So what is a scientist doing? They're trying to uncover universal truths about the physical world 
in many cases. And so when it comes to business intelligence or data analysis, we're often working on very particular questions and problems that only apply in a certain space. You know, like what was our sales in the APAC region in Q2 of a certain product category? That doesn't involve any, the, the trick is, and actually we bring this up in our process when we talk about this guess or hypothesis. Notice how I said guess or hypothesis, because the word hypothesis tends to more apply to the, uh, the scientific realm, as well as, as we know, the statistical realm, where we're making inferences about general rules or populations. But sometimes, in many cases, I think the vast majority of cases in the business intelligence space, we're just working with basic questions about what happened in the past, you know? Uh, and so in those cases, yeah, I think the, what's interesting is um, it's a simpler scenario and a more common scenario for everyday people who aren't engaged in science, but it's also one that we just botch. We just really have a lot of cognitive flaws about the way we ask and answer very basic questions with data in my experience. And so we try to talk a little bit about the reasons why we get those things wrong, you know, um, sometimes overgeneralizing, you know, it's not just that, um, instead of saying people in the survey um, liked product A more than product B, we run around the building and say product A is the winner. You know, it's, it's, it's what's going to be better. It's what's, it's what everyone likes more. And then someone says, wait a second, what was your sample size again on that survey you ran? You know, And so we tend to, and um, I include myself in that, we tend to overreach. We tend to almost treat it as if it were scientific. So I, the short answer is, I think there's a very big difference between data literacy and scientific literacy. There's an overlap there because scientists use data, don't they? Um, but I think a lot of times when we're using data, it's not in a scientific pr pursuit, even though we call it data science. Well, those questions about predicting things that are going to happen, those are getting more into um, ground that is to me a much more similar to science because you're trying to make um, you know, predictions and forecasts. You're trying to adjust processes automatically based on some rules that you learn about the way things work based on what's in the data. And then there's just the general analysis or reporting kind of a role where it isn't very scientific, I don't think, or and I would say it's not like like pure science, right? So anyway, that's a bit of a long-winded answer, but hopefully that makes sense. I do think there's a lot of ways we, we say literacy matters, financial literacy, media literacy, data literacy. These are all just kind of becoming proficient in areas of our life in which, you know, maybe we're being asked to do things we, we weren't asked to do before. Um, so I think that that's also important. So let me stop there. Nathan, I'm turning it back over to you. I know we're out of time. I, so, was, yeah. I was actually going to ask you if you have another like five minutes uh, tomorrow. <laughs> asked a really good question that I do. Oh, yeah, I do. Yeah, that's okay. Yeah, yeah, perfect. Have you seen it? It's in the chat. And it was tomorrow? Yep. Tamara Peterson. Yeah, I love your point about expanding our critical thinking skills. What advice do you have for sharing our analysis with those that are not data savvy or possibly don't have complex critical thinking skills? Yeah, so uh, first piece of advice is assume they do uh, have great thinking skills and speak to them as if they do. In the mature phase, we do talk though about ways you can step someone into an understanding of something. You know, um, we show people slides with a whole bunch of boxes, right? And what do we do? We build the slide step by step, one box, then one arrow, then another box. We've been doing this with PowerPoint for years now. But when it comes to data, we just throw the whole chart up there and slap it in the face. There you go. There's the chart. Well, why don't we build a chart? Why don't we show an axis and then put the dots out on the X axis and then move them vertically based on how the other variable, you know, and then add size to the dots and talk about what that tells us and then add color to the, so you take a, a scatter plot you know, how can you actually kind of gradually think of it like, you know, part of what I'm doing right now is, and I need to find a way to do this that's not condescending to my audience, but I'm trying to teach them about what it is. And it's a training, it's a presentation about the data, but to do it well, I need to train them. I've been looking at the data for weeks now, and it's just ingrained in my brain, but I need to remember they haven't seen it yet. I'm going to show them a chart that I've been looking at, and it's just, you know, I, I can probably tell it to you in my sleep, but they haven't seen it yet. So how do I get them to the place where they come along and understand? And I think that it involves, yeah, I don't think you need to spend a lot of time on it. Like I can 
make a chart. I think we have an example of it here. I'm talking about this example of a uh, of a scatter plot, right? So I'll just show you what I mean real quick uh, that would kind of illustrate a practical point, I think, um, about, oh, that's just so, that's just so not surprising. Okay, hold on. <laughs> I'm using a different, um, I'm using a different uh, browser than I normally use here. All right, so let's see if we come in here, maybe I'm hiding it, that would be bad. Uh, yep, I sure am. Oh, no, it's right here. So here's my point, right? I can say, okay, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to show you how uh, life expectancy correlates with urbanization. And I say, well, hey, let's start by placing all the 200 countries on the horizontal axis based on the life expectancy. So there's, you know, Cambodia over here. Over here, we have Iceland in terms of how long people are expected to live. And then, you know, hey, let's move these dots. We have all this space up here. Why don't we just move them based on what percentage of people live in a city? Oh, interesting. Look at this kind of curved shape. Hmm, maybe we can see if there's interesting something going on here by, by region. Let's take a look at that, you know, and see our European countries over here, Sub-Saharan African countries. What, what about the big countries? Where are they? Oh, they're over here, China, India. And then let's, you know what, let's just set this thing in motion. So let's just see what happens if we move forward, you know, from the 70s. And then I can speed it up and go all the way up until today. So you see, this is what I mean. And now if I just show this thing to an audience, they're going to be like, what are all these dots? And they're going to be overwhelmed. But I think it, it's not that hard to make simple steps and build simple steps into our presentations to communicate to them in a way that helps them get caught up, you know, bring them up to speed in a way that's, I, what did that take me? Like a minute, two, 60 seconds? I'm terrible at guessing time when I'm presenting, but I do think that was a fairly easy build. And we do that with slides. Why don't we do it with data? You can be a data literacy champion by doing this kind of a thing and you know, taking it upon yourself, right? To teach, to teach what it is that you're trying to show. So there we go. I'll, I'll leave you with that practical tip that we bake into, um, into our course. So how are we doing, Nathan? Another one, or should we call it good? I think we should call it good because I have a couple of things that I need to go over before cool. we all sign out. Yeah. Um, so I'm just going to take over the screen here Please um, do. so I can show uh, on, and maybe I can get our faces out of there. There we go. <laughs> okay. So uh, on Friday, um, June 17th at noon, we have Jimmy Nguyen, two, he's going to be presenting two and through data science. Um, for all of you who were here today asking questions about, you know, career oriented questions or uh, even Tamara's question about, um, you know, giving a presentation to, uh, I'll say, non technical uh, people, um, Jimmy's going to be a really good resource for you. He's talking about his, his journey through data science and you know, his highs, his lows, um, you know, how to be triumphant. Um, he did a part-time master's for seven years and he's going to, so he started out in accounting and finance and now he's a senior data scientist at LinkedIn. So if you have any career oriented questions, I would really push you to uh, join our webinar on the 17th. And then going back to tomorrow's question about uh, data-driven presentations, uh, July 6th, uh, we actually have a webinar on that. So tomorrow, um, I think you should, or anybody else that also has that question, I think you should join our webinar on July 6th. Um, thank you very much, Ben. It was a pleasure having you. And uh, thank you, Fatima and uh, Megan for, for helping get this set up. Um, thank you all for joining. Thank you all for your questions. I think this was a really good session. Uh, and um, hopefully we'll see some of you, if not all of you on Friday. Um, and I hope everybody has a good rest of their day.